you kind of look at it and go, well, actually, the, there is a risk of just staying in cash. Yeah. You're losing money every single year. The, the risk of not investing can actually be greater than the risk of investing. And it's, it's the word risk as well for me. I think it's kind of always comes with a negative connotation. You know, risk is, is a is a bad thing and it's not when it's managed. So you know, consider the, the emotion, consider the goal. What is the actual objective for this money? What do you I, think? I, I, is it coming home? Good morning, afternoon, evening, whenever you, you're watching our podcast today. Um, my name's Jamie Sexton. Welcome to the Do More of Your Money podcast, episode 76. Can't believe we've been uh, doing them for this uh, long. We're joined by a, a star audience. Um, we've got George Maguire Bell, I thought the independent <laughs> centre half right at the back, managing people's money. Greg Rice Lang. I'll take that. Yeah, I'll take that. that. The man in the middle of the park. Yep. And Craig Rooney Almond. I'll definitely take that. <laughs> not the looks, but the, maybe it's not the looks, but the goal scoring uh, talent. Not, not retired yet either. Yeah. I didn't think of a name for myself, but so welcome, gents. There, the, the session today is we're we're talking about is how to manage risk when investing. But first question that's on everyone's mind is, is it coming home? I mean, if we're talking about being footballers and I'm the midfielder, the big centre half, the the dynamic goal scorer, you would be the goalkeeper, Jamie. Yeah, I and as somebody that's played football against you, I know you're a big, clumsy goalkeeper. So you couldn't be, you couldn't be Jordan Pickford. Maybe a David James. <laughs> yeah. Who's known for being a bit of a calamity. No, yeah, I think I'm a definitely, definitely don't have the ability of Jordan Pickford. But uh, I think I was one of the, the sort of the, the young, slow, overweight kid that was that was put in goal. Yes. Um, but it, it worked out for us anyway. Um, but no, welcome. I think uh, Craig, this is your your first podcast. So first time. Um, just if you want to just give a, a little bit of an introduction to yourself. Yeah, well. so I work in the occupational pension transfer team um, and I'm a pension transfer specialist. So I look at clients' final salary pensions with the aim to move them into a true potential personal pension if it's the right thing for them to do. So yeah, I've been doing that for four years. Great, I think Craig's um, probably one of the most technical people I know in the business. So I might, yes. um, I think we'll do some challenging questions for him today, uh, specifically around some hard pension questions, I think. Keep them on his toes. Yeah, yeah. keep them on his yeah. toes. Uh, okay, so it's in typical uh, podcast fashion. George, can you give us a little update of what's happening on the markets this week? Yeah, I'll give it a go, Jamie. Um, interesting week this week, and I think if we look at equity markets, yesterday we saw some profit taken after quite a strong rally, which we had coming through last week. So we have seen some volatility return to the market. We often refer to the VIX index um, on morning markets. That popped up above 20, but by afternoon it was back down below 19. So you did see a bit of a bout of volatility. It's nice to see some green back on the board in the equity markets there this morning. But before I get too far into it, I think the first point is we can draw a lot of parallels between what's happening within the equity market and the bond market. So quite a lot of attention on the bond market this week. If we look at UK gilts, we've seen the yield on a 10-year UK government bond come in about 10 basis points to 0.61%. We've seen the yield on a 30-year government bond coming in around 11 basis points to 1.12%. If we look at US Treasury, so the US bond market, you've seen the two-year yield, which has moved in four basis points. We've seen the 10-year yield move in 12 basis points to around 1.3%, and the 30-year yield move in around eight basis points to 1.9%. So what's that telling us? It's telling us the shape of the yield curve is actually changing. So you've seen a bigger move at the longer end. What that's telling us is the yield curve is flatter. So if you hear us talking about the shape of the yield curve and flatness in the yield curve, that's an example of what we've seen this week. What that in, a, in itself is inferring is inflation expectations at the longer end of the curve are, are starting to moderate. Growth and inflation expectations are in real focus at the moment, not just in the US, in the UK, in Europe, across in China as well, because central bankers are really battling to manage the two sides of meeting full employment, so not being a headwind towards growth, but also managing inflation and inflation expectations overall. We saw evidence of that ongoing battle in China yesterday where you had the PBOC stepping back into markets to promote liquidity to really ensure that they are maintaining momentum in the growth um, without derailing um, it, the economy in terms of inflation. So you saw yields pull in around seven basis points yesterday. So some, some really interesting moves within the bond market, which you saw yesterday and indeed throughout the week. In terms of the dollar, the dollar was up about 0.2% over the week in terms of sterling, a little bit weaker sterling against the dollar was at around 138. You've seen sterling against the euro at around 116. 
throughout the week. But in terms of the interesting aspects of economic events, I think maybe if I just touch on three, try and keep this one brief, but they all have a very similar theme. And those themes, again, go back to inflation. The first one was on Tuesday in the US, we had the service PMI data, which missed expectations. It came in at 60.1 relative to expectations of 63.5. Now, just for some indication, that's an index where anything above 50 is demonstrating expansion in the sector. So a level of 60 is still a really strong read and it's still demonstrating strong expansion of the service sector, forward looking orders, employment levels. So it's a positive number, but it was just that missing expectations which took markets by surprise. On Wednesday, we received the minutes from the Federal Reserve Open Market Committee meeting, which took place in June. Now, we already knew the outcome of the meeting, maintaining interest rates at the current level of zero to zero spot two five percent asset purchases maintained at the current pace of 120 billion dollars per month but it was the change in the dot plots which caught investors attention essentially what the dot plots were telling us was the expectations that interest rate hikes would start to come through moved from around 2024 through to the back end of 2023 so rate hikes potentially coming through a little bit earlier than expected but the reason for that was because the data, the growth story, is much stronger than was anticipated because of the success of the vaccination programme, because of the success of the stimulus programmes by both the Treasury but also by the central bank as well. So what did the minutes tell us? Well, it told us that pro- the progress of the recovery still has some way to go, but the conditions which would allow them to start to revisit their current policy measures are, are, are changing quicker than perhaps initially expected. So they're meeting those goals earlier than they first anticipated, so they may start to to revisit the way in which they package monetary policy. It demonstrated the need for careful language in terms of how they communicate um, policy, and they they did stress that they would provide good notice if if they were to, to intend to change policy in any format. But I think the really interesting aspect of the minutes, and this is why the minutes get so much attention, is because you can really get a feel for the language and the debate which is happening within the committee. And there's quite a bit of dispersion at this point in time between the Fed members in terms of the timing in which to raise rates, how to raise rates, and also how to manage the package of, of quantitative easing as well. So there was a bit of movement in the bond market after that event, but but not too much because, as I say, quite a lot of this information was already baked in following the press release back in June. The final aspect which I I thought was interesting over the week was we had the European Central Bank presentation of their strategy review, which was the first since 2003. The reason why it's interested is that the review actually started in January 2020, so several months before the brunt of the pandemic hit Europe. And we know since that time they've pulled a number of levers in terms of monetary policy, bringing interest rates down to zero bounds. We've seen a, a 1.85 trillion euro pandemic emergency program come in. So policy in itself has changed vastly. In terms of how they bring about that that review, they use MEPs, they use academics, they use central bankers and citizens as well to make sure that their policy is effective. The big changes or the, the, the big developments from the review, one is a slight change in way, the way in which they measure and, and view and, and target inflation. It used to be 2% or, or just below. Now they're allowing a bit more flexibility, so allowing periods of overshoot and undershoot. It just means that they, they've got a bit more opportunity to almost remain dovish, which the central bank themselves would, would deny. They would say that it's still very much focused on their primary goals, but it allows a bit more flexibility in the management of inflation. The second aspect was really around climate goals, which are back on the table. The topic did go away slightly in central banks as we were working through the pandemic, but it's back on the table in terms of how they're going to use climate goals and objectives in in that perspective to manage the way in which they deal with companies. In the sense, they may start to look at companies and the way in which they're buying bonds from these companies on a means-tested basis in terms of their carbon output. So interesting week, a lot of focus on the bond market. I think it boils down to growth expectations and inflation expectations. Brilliant. Thanks, George. Um, re- really useful uh, update for us there. Um, gents, let's let's jump straight into the, the sort of topic of the day, um, which is, is how to manage the, the risk when investing. Um, I think it's you know something that I mentioned in terms of a topic we, we could discuss in terms of the levels of risk um, that clients may want to take at different points in their life. And Craig, I'll, I'll jump to you first from, a, from an advisor perspective. I know you give 
um, you know, quite a number, of, a lot of advice on, yeah. on sort of occupational pensions. But just talk to me about how you would assess a, an individual's risk in terms of investing yeah. and then potentially some other risks that the, the clients yeah, need so to I consider th- when, when looking at investing. I think with conversations around risk, they have to be right at the forefront of any kind of, when you're speaking to clients about putting money away or investing, not only from a pension perspective, but it could be an ISA or, or a GIA or whatever it may be. And I think from an advice perspective, there's, there's kind of three key areas that we, we look to cover on or focus on. The first one is obviously investment experience. Has the client invested before? What current or, or past investments have they had? And also, have they experienced volatility in the market? So George talked about the recovery from COVID. Have they dealt with that in the past? Are they around for the financial crisis back in 2009? Have they seen fluctuations in, a, in their portfolio? It doesn't matter if it's yes or no, but what we need to do really there is it allows us to grasp if the client has understanding of investment, have they got risk principles, risk versus reward, what's the kind of understanding they've got quite a high level before then we move down into the next kind of topics. The next one we look at typically is a capacity for loss. So this is much more of an affordability thing. Um, can the client afford to invest money? Can they afford to lose money? Would a loss of the investment impact the standard of living? And if it would, would they would we recommend invest? Probably not. But if they can, then that's great. We can then move on and, and tick that box. And it's a very objective measure of risk. And can the client afford to do it? The last kind of area which you talk about is risk tolerance. A relatively new one, but it's much more of the emotional and behavioural side of risk. What's a client's um, you know, tolerance to risk? What's their understanding and can they interpret it? Let's say their portfolio fell by 5%, 10%. How would that make them feel? Would they get nervous, uncomfortable? Would they look to de-risk? And I think if we can ascertain them three areas, we can pinpoint quite quickly where the, where we, where the client sits in our risk parameters and, and look to try and put them in the best fitting portfolio for them. And I think within each level of risk, you've got you know, sub-risk. So I talked about uh, risk tolerances. The behavioural, how would the fluctuations in the value of their fund be? So you've got sequencing risk, for example. Let's say they're in a kind of more aggressive portfolio. The daily fluctuations there, their fund's going to be more significant. So let's say they're drawing from the pension when the market's going up and down. They might draw from the pension at a, a low point in the market, which would have a bigger long-term impact on the value of the fund. Not say it's drawn, it's fell by 4%, they draw 4%. That could be 8% off the original fund value. So to make up that 8% back up, is a lot more of a, a lot more of a challenge than let's say the four percent. So that's an example of an, a risk which isn't just investment risk. And I think it's important, Craig. So you, and I'll jump across to you on this, Greg, because I think it's important when you look at these, when you start to have these discussions, and when, when people are thinking about understanding what their risks, it could be a very different discussion to talk about their, you know, their investment experience yeah. and their investment risk based on someone who's twenty five year old starting to yeah. invest to someone that's fifty nine that's looking to. Um, that is looking to sort of take from their pension and and also you they might have different objectives so you mean like, with each money i think it, and this is something people should consider greg and yeah something I think we talk about quite a lot craig craig obviously just mentioned there but we've got a range of products on the platform and you know you, you may have an isa with a shorter term goal which could be for you know a, a, a child's wedding or a child's you know yeah. school funds as you mentioned on the last podcast mm-hmm. which then is going to be different to say your pension so mm-hmm. You know you've got an ISA, say, with a five-year, ten-year term. Mm. You might want to take less risk with that because it's a, an event you're going to mm-hmm. come to sooner, whereas your pension is, I'm not going to age you yeah. on the podcast, Jamie, but you've certainly yeah. got a, a few more years than ten years yeah. to retire, which means you've got a longer time in the market, mm-hmm. which means in your scenario you might be able to be more aggressive with your pension because mm-hmm. you've got longer to run with that. Your retirement is further away, which means, as Craig mentioned, when you've got those mm-hmm. fluctuations, You've got a longer time to fight against the market. So the, the 2009 crash is a good example of, you know, if you'd invested for two years and that was one of the years you were invested in, you, you're obviously mm-hmm. going to suffer a loss. Um, so, yeah, I think one of the great things with using the technology, using our, our investment platform is you've got multiple products or multiple tax wrappers, mm-hmm. which in turn can have multiple terms, but most importantly, different risk. Mm-hmm. So my, my example, I've got a... A general investment account which I'm ultra aggressive with. I've got a pension which I'm capital growth, so I'm not mm. ultra aggressive with. And then an ISA which is almost my rainy day fund, but I'm, I've not set a term on that. That's then in the balanced portfolio. Mm. So I've got three different products, three different terms, and, and three different risk ratings, but also, you know, three different goals for them, which mm. is something we've talked about, you know, a lot on the podcast, mm. which is goal setting and the reason you're investing. And for me, I think matching your risk to your goal mm-hmm. is also very important because if you want your son to go to you know a good school, you're going to mm-hmm. have to make sure it's in the the, the, the right you know goal target 
amount, and I think you mentioned a hundred thousand yeah. pounds, which made my eyes water when I was listening <laughs> to the podcast. Um, yeah. But at the same time, to hit that goal, you've got to take mm. the right level of risk. It, so, yeah, it's it's really interesting, Greg, because I think um, you know from from my perspective, it's you've got your short term and your, your long term, and you're right. It's it's about how you how you match a goal um, against the risk, um, and. I think this is what clients, when you when you're doing, and you're looking at your um, when you're looking at your sort of doing your risk questionnaire with your advisor, um, you know, consider the the motion, consider the goal. What is the actual objective for this money, um, and then make that decision. George, George I'll, I'll jump across to you quickly because I think it's it's important. Where I think sometimes with you know there'll be certain clients that are a little bit more understand of what actually a higher risk portfolio is, but there'll be certain clients that obviously work with their advisor and, and they invest the money, but. Actually, what if I'm higher risk or lower risk? What does that mean from an investment perspective? It's a good question. I think the, the the key approach to risk, which people often think about within investment, is market risk. So market risk is the the, the risk which you experience being invested within a financial market, either from economic events, certain specific company events. Um, in general, if you are a defensive client, you would tend to have more government bonds, you would tend to have more in cash, which are considered to be more safer assets. If you're an aggressive client, you would tend to have more exposure to company stocks and shares, more equity risk. You may even have more exposure to areas such as higher yield bonds. These offer a greater return profile, but you're taking a bit more risk. You haven't got the risk of holding cash or, 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 or the, 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 the aspect of holding cash or a government bond. So I think in terms of moving from a defensive profile to an aggressive profile. The key difference in terms of portfolio construction is you'd have a greater exposure towards equity risk. But it's it's always an interesting question when you get asked about risk management because in the investment team we think about this in a number of ways. We think about okay the actual management from construction and from a day to day management perspective, but also from a monitoring perspective. And there's many different types of risk. You've got market risk as I say, is a, is a key one there. You've got concentration risk, which is the risk of having all of your eggs in one basket. You've got credit risk, which is the risk that the counterparty which you're working with, so it may be a company who you're buying a bond off, defaults and you can't get back your principal. Mm. You've got liquidity risk, where markets seize up and you can't actually get your money out. So these are all risks which we tackle within the portfolios in a number of different ways. So if we think about the monitoring side of this, couple of ways in which we do this. One is to regularly stress test our portfolios, to run them through situations such as the global financial crisis. 2020 will be in pretty much every economic textbook mm -hmm. going forward. It'll be a part of every stress test going forward. But we use a range of different different events because no stress test is ever the same as what actually happens moving forward. So you stress it in a number of ways. It's ultimately to say, okay, this is how the portfolio would perform in this period. And this is liquidity profile. In that event, can we actually get the money out? So we do that on a regular basis within the portfolios to ensure that we've got a resilient model, but also a, a liquid model for clients as well. We also do regular assessment to ensure that when a client does go through the questionnaire, they do assign their risk bands, that our portfolios are operating within those risk bands. So at least once a month, we're doing a deep dive assessment to say, okay, that's all of the underlying holdings, that's the risk profile does that meet the bandings which is suitable for that client? We do due diligence on all of our service providers, so ensuring that they are credible parties to be working with. We've got a full understanding of how their systems, their checks and their balances work. But in terms of management, and this is really comes in two parts, you've got, okay, how do you manage for market risk? At a construction perspective, the word there is diversification. So you can go away from having that concentration risk, all eggs in one basket. You can look at, say, okay, I want a basket of equities. We provide exposure to a range of different companies in terms of size, sectors they operate in, but also um, in terms of the geographical location as well. We then diversify that with assets such as bonds. So typically in, in a traditional relationship, they have a, a fairly low or inverse correlation. So typically you would see if, if you have more challenging environments in the equity market, a bond market may be performing more, more, more beneficially. That doesn't always hold in every environment. So we take it one step further within a multi-asset portfolio. We offer alternative assets as well, which generally in 2020 was a great yeah. example of that. I think George, the, the di we, we, we bang on about diversification, um, but the, the COVID um, crisis and the, and the drop in the market was a prime example of why diversification 
works. Yeah. Um, and, and you look at, you know, not every company failed during COVID. Actually, some companies exceeded, you know, look at us as a business. Yeah. It, it's been our best ever year. And it's, you know, we talk about sort of bouncing, you know, what's actually in front of you and how do you, you bounce back from that. But, you know, I look at Amazon, just an amazing firm that reacted, yeah. you know, they had the correct model. Yeah. But, it, you know, a, a prime example of, a company that was able to react to an environment and is now, you know, same as I said, same with true potential. Exactly. So in, 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 in twenty twenty in itself, you know, you saw a huge bout of volatility. For active managers, you know, we're seeing managers who are actually seeing regular mm-hmm. inflows into their mm-hmm. portfolios so weren't concerned about having to sell down assets yeah. to meet redemption needs. They could use that volatility as an opportunity. You're buying a quality mm-hmm. company, but at a discounted price you've got a better profile for mm-hmm. for a higher return. So Diversification is how we set the framework and the foundations, but there's the active management side of it as well. How managers can pull levers in order to reduce risk when required, but also how they can add to risk and the type of exposure they get within that risk to actually say, okay, we're managing the risk, we're managing the downside here, but we're actually participating in the upside as well, which is really important. I think this you've got a balance when you're investing, like the risk versus reward, yeah. and, and the risk of actually if you don't invest, then actually there's a loss with that. And, and this is something else we talk about quite a lot, but it's it's quite evident, isn't it, Greg, mm-hmm. where you, you kind of look at it and go, well, actually, the, there is a risk of just staying in cash. You, yep. You're losing money every single year. And, you know, it's something we, we talk about quite a lot. Yeah, we've, we've, we've talked inflation to death, yeah. but I think it's one of those we should continue to talk yeah. about it because with, you know, the, the risk of not investing can actually be greater than the risk of investing. Yeah. And it, it's the word risk as well for me. I think it's kind of always comes with a negative connotation you know risk is, is a is a bad thing and it's not when it's managed so we we had a new starter in a couple of weeks ago and i was i was explaining the the risk profile questionnaire we've got a, a series of questions which you come out with a, a, a definition and it was it was interesting because i said answer these questions and if i give you one million pounds how would you invest it and they came out aggressive and then i asked the same questions but said if I give you ten thousand mm. pounds, and they came out balanced, yeah. and what I think was interesting is that ten thousand pounds, they knew it was real money. It mm. was it was a reasonable about amount of money that they had, and when I was explaining the way the risk works, as I, I used a terrible a, a analogy which I normally do, but I said you're a Formula One driver and you're going into a fast corner. It's when do you break? Do you take that little bit more mm. risk to go quicker than the? Yeah. The counterparts mm-hmm. but don't break mm-hmm. too late otherwise you're spinning mm-hmm. off the track and it it made sense to them they, they, they were a sporty mm-hmm. person so thankfully they understood the analogy but I, I was I when I'm explaining it with new starters people new to financial mm-hmm. services I, I always go for a, a more r- relatable mm-hmm. analogy but yes for me inflation is probably the biggest risk when you look at how many trillions of pounds sits in mm-hmm. cash and you know all of, mm-hmm. all of the other things we, we've discussed I think mm-hmm. was episode 72 yeah. on inflation from from memory but really for me it's it's all about speak with a member of the team speak with an advisor yeah. mm-hmm. speak with a, a member of head office go through the process of understanding your risk because we've got five outputs i yeah. mentioned this before we we started we've got defensive mm-hmm. cautious balanced capital growth aggressive yeah. each of those have got a portfolio which george and the team runs and it, mm-hmm. it directly correlates but there is a sixth one, which is a, a zero risk investor. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Normally that's not because somebody's scared of going into the market. It's normally because of what we talked about a little mm-hmm. earlier, which is they need the money in a short period of mm-hmm. time. So it's it's not a long term investment or they're not willing to take enough of that risk. So they're not willing to break late into mm-hmm. the corner in the example. They're wanting to just go mm-hmm. slow and steady mm-hmm. round that corner, not to win the race, mm-hmm. but just to kind of complete the race yeah. is probably the the way of looking at it, but there is always that danger of hitting an oil slick, which is the the inflation, I guess, if I keep that yeah. terrible analogy going. No, it, it makes sense. It's, it's the Once again, it's balancing the risk against the, the reward that you need to take. And I think it's, we'll, we'll keep going back to this, but it, it's really important to, to look at your goal and your objective. When you think, when you're going through these questionnaires with your advisor, or you're talking about, well, actually, how much risk should I take? really just think about wh- where are you going how long is your money going to be invested for when are you going to need it um you know if it did drop 10 percent next for example my pension if it drops 20 percent next year for me I'll, I'll be upset george um i'll blame you for it but no i'll be upset but actually it can't affect us because i can't take it out anyway yeah. mm-hmm. um because I'm, I'm too young for that at this minute in time but 
well, one of the things that kind of drives me a little bit, um, you know, not so much potty when I, when I look at some of these, some of the workplace pension funds, and they're designed for clients to de-risk to, to, to retirement age. And what happens is they're effectively going to low, you know, sort of lower volatility assets or things such as cash. And by the time they're, they're you know, they're, they've hit 65 or 60, whatever the retirement age is, it's into, you know, 60 or 65. And if I'm a, you know, if I'm a, a client where I'm potentially got an inheritance tax problem or actually don't need money from that pension, that's actually the wrong risk profile for me mm-hmm. because I'm getting very little growth. I don't need the money. You know, on average, people live to their 84, so there's another 20 years worth of investing there. Yeah. Um, it's in the it's in the wrong profile. I think it's important when you're thinking about it. Craig, you obviously talk yeah. you do a lot of this, don't you, when yeah, you're sorting sure. clients? I think it's a very traditional way of looking at it, and I think it stems from the point where pre pre pension freedoms you had to go and purchase an annuity, mm-hmm. and obviously de risking down towards a cash asset to go and buy an annuity it made complete sense because you don't want to have your fund as you're nearing retirement mm-hmm. the volatility going up mm-hmm. and down when you need to acquire something for a capital cost. So I think that tradition traditionally it stems from there. What we're seeing going forward is with pension freedoms and drawdown arrangements is clients typically don't need that level of fixed mm. income, particularly if you're talking about defined benefit pension transfers. Mm. A big driver for moving from a defined benefit pension to a personal pension could be, I don't need that level of income and I've got other aspirations that I'd like to like to meet and that isn't appropriate for it. Mm. Um, so what we say is actually being invested throughout the entire life cycle and like entire retirement is more appropriate than going to a low-risk mm. asset. So let's say the client's got two state pensions in payment and they've got an NHS pension. That's more than sufficient to meet their day-to-day expenditure. They might have an additional a bit additional final salary scheme which they don't need that income from. So by moving into a personal pension and having a consistent risk profile throughout the retirement, let's say it was balanced, that means that money's going to be invested over a 30-year period and it can be used to supplement their income where they need it, but it could also be preservation of wealth for the family, passing it on to the children or whatever it may be. It could be an inheritance tax problem. Mm. And I think what that does there, it lets them maintain their asset at a good level of risk so they can maintain growth in the portfolio without going down to a lower level where they're not going to get a lot from it. And I think that's an important conversation that you have with the client. And uh, just to add what Greg said earlier as well, you've got where clients are zero risk or not risk investors. A lot of times from my dealings with clients is a lack of understanding mm. about what risk is. So actually when you go through and analyse the questions again with them and explain the implications of loss and risk and explain investment term, they actually change the, their mm-hmm. opinion and the behavioural and emotional side of investment when you're mm-hmm. talking about risk tolerance changes that. And I think it's getting clients understanding what, what risk is and what is an appropriate level for them is, is paramount when you're looking to put some money on. I think that questionnaire in terms of the risk profile questionnaire which, um, which we, we run on our sites and tools um, for the advisors, it's good as an aid to, sort of, to guide mm-hmm. a client to yeah. go down but it really needs some explanation yeah. sometimes, which is, you know, when you look at the graphs and say, well, would you, if you took this much loss, you could get this much gain, which one would you do? Yeah. And and you put if you put that alongside, actually, currently you're losing this much money in the in a bank account because of, yeah. you know, the inflation risk, yeah. mm-hmm. and you have that discussion with clients, it, it gets them thinking a little bit, you know, get them thinking a, bit, a little bit differently. I think just kind of going to the same with you, Craig, on this, because as an, as an advisor, when should a client speak to their advisor to talk actually... I might want to increase my risk, or I might. Yeah. At what points in their lives? Because we, we assess it every year as part of part of the ongoing service that we deliver to clients. But when should you consider that actually I, I might need to, to reduce or increase yeah. my risk? I think as Greg talked about earlier, it's linked to investment horizon and goal. So there's two kind of aspects to it. I'll focus on kind of investment horizon or term as it's more kind of traditionally known. I think I'll use a pension example. You've got an accumulation and a decumulation phase traditionally. So mm. one where you're building assets and one where you're looking to take take an asset or benefits from a fund. In the accumulation phase, so let's say 30 years from retirement, I know I'm personally in an aggressive fund. I've got 30 years. I can I can deal with the daily fluctuations. One, I can't access a pension as you talked about. But two, again, it's, it's a goal so far in the future that it doesn't particularly bother us. And what I'm looking to do is maximise the potential growth within the fund. So I'm more than happy to go into a higher risk profile. Alternatively, let's say you're at retirement and you look to take a regular income from your fund via drawdown, you might want to reduce the risk. For, um, I talked about secrets and risk earlier on, where, you, where you're drawn from a fund and the market's good for. And I think being in a more kind of um, p- profile which is going to maintain its value, less volatility might be more appropriate for somebody who's looking to take a regular income. Because again, then the fluctuations, and you're going to be looking at your pension more often, you're not going to see it going down, and your withdrawals will be much more consistent from a fund which maintains its value. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, no, th- thanks, Craig. I think it's, um, as I said, it's important to discuss, we always say, discuss this with your advisor. If you're mm-hmm. unsure... Which is possible. Yeah, if, you, if you're unsure if actually you're in the right, right risk profile or you might want to take, you know, a bit more risk because you're kind of thinking about what we're talking about, then then speak to your advisor. Yeah. 
I think I had a, a lot of, I think you did as well, Craig and, and some of you, George, last last year I had a lot of conversations with clients when the market started to drop. And, and even, you know, I had my own money in the funds. So it, it can feel uncomfortable when your money, when your money drops. But um, when, when my main focus around the discussion with clients was, was very much around, uh, well, yes, I understand we've, we've had a drop now, but what is your objective for this money? Yeah. And because most clients go, well, should I de-risk now? And actually moving, if we, if we kind of just rewind back to March, if you move from a aggressive or even a balance to defensive, you missed a very big bounce back that come, come mm -hmm. at the start yeah. of April. And it's why you kind of have to take the emotion out of, of looking what's going on because realistically, if you're investing, you should be investing for at least five years. That, that's how I would advise a client. Um, and then I said that the level of risk depends on, yeah. on exactly yeah, what you, you You make yeah. your worst decisions when you've got raw emotion, yeah, don't you? I think yeah. that's a just a human factor. Mm -hmm. you, you, everybody who's made a bad decision, normally it's mm -hmm. heat of the moment or, you know, you you've been wound up or something, a bit of road rage, you know, it's always when you've got a bit of uh, vented up. So I, I always just make a comparison to the housing market, Jamie. You, mm. you wouldn't normally think to sell your house when the house market values mm. are low. Yeah. And that was the same conversation mm. we were having with clients, with advisors throughout March, April of, of 20 mm. was, yes, the, the unit value is lower, mm. but you still own the same number of units. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's the same as your home. You own the same number of bricks you on the same number of windows mm. your house hasn't changed yeah. it's just the market value of it's mm. changed so you weren't thinking about selling your house mm -hmm. just mm. because it's worth less you wouldn't sell it mm -hmm. and it was the same message really with your pension it's, it's an asset it holds a value and its value at that time was low and you know we we did have a a number of clients get mm. in touch and obviously we wanted to keep them in their in their seats and the information that came out from George, Jeff, the investment management team on a, mm. a daily basis, another plug for Morning Markets. But yeah. um, the Morning Markets were, were fantastic for me mm. as an investor, but also for me as somebody that speaks daily with advisors mm. and clients because I was able to relay the message on. But yeah, I, I always like making comparisons and analogies, as you can probably tell. But that was mm. the big one for me is you wouldn't sell it because it's worth less. It's not the right time to sell the cash or to, and, and obviously it, it proven with the, mm -hmm. the very speedy recovery from the, yeah. not just the markets, but the investment team. Yeah, we, we had a lot of clients obviously ringing up and what's going on, which right, you thought uh, some clients have you know, a lot of money invested. Mm -hmm. Again, it, it could be a pound, it could be a million pounds, it doesn't matter, it's all relative. What we saw was clients ringing up and saying, look, me, put, my pension portfolio has dropped by X amount, um, can I go into cash? And we'd have to, after a conversation with them and you'd explain to them, you know, by, by moving into cash or de-risking, you're essentially crystallising your loss. So as you said, you're looking to sell your house mm -hmm. at the bottom of the market, which mm -hmm. is, you, it's a good analogy really when you think about mm -hmm. putting something which they can relate to. Mm -hmm. um, you know, what you'd miss out there if you cashed out at the bottom of the market was quite a significant and quick rebound. I think George will probably talk about and knows a lot more than I will. It was a, it was a quite a significant drop, but the, the recovery from that was exponential really. Yeah. The yeah. drop was actually, it was about 33 days from, from yeah. peak to trough. It was 90, 91, 92 days mm -hmm. for the recovery. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's one of the fastest mm -hmm. y y on, yeah. on record. And it just, you know, we felt the volatility come through. We, the big change, the big shift was when central bankers and, and government stepped in with their stimulus package. But yeah, it, you know, it's a, it, it's a, it's a really un understandable aspect of the emotional side of investment. And that's why it's important to go through those questions at the outset, just to, to understand that tolerance. I think what, you know, I actually looked at the overall numbers um, afterwards in terms of the amount of clients that sort of, sort of rang in and, and want to have a discussion. Very few actually went into cash, but yeah. actually it wasn't a huge amount of people that called into us, which tells you that actually the, the advisors and, and ourselves mm -hmm. have done a good job in terms of explaining risk up front. So you understand actually, I remember speaking to Earl about it when, they, when the markets were, you, you could tell the, the difference in age within the within the company here because you've got the the sort of the older more experienced that's the the polite way to put it um you know they've lived through you know three or four of these mm -hmm. and they've always seen it come back and markets yeah. always do come back up you know com good companies you know there's a lot of good companies in the market that will their share prices will pick back up yeah. um and you know, i talk yeah. about airlines at the minute I haven't checked their stocks yesterday, but I, I bet there's I bet there's been an increase yesterday based on them changing the um, mm. changing the the law in terms of the amber yep. list. But I, I mean, it's it's one of those things. You had markets which fell in those thirty three days, some thirty five percent mm. in, in 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 dollar terms. You know they've they they came back within sort of ninety ninety one days, and they they're around twelve thirteen percent above where they were pre 
pre-drop so you know it came back and some so if you sold out at the bottom that's a real shame because you've missed you one you've crystallized yeah you know the difference between mm -hmm. where the unit price was on the 21st and the 23rd and if you tried to time it you may not have caught it and um, you see all sorts of stats i saw one the other day where it was looking at markets between uh, 2005 and 2020 in the US and if you invested um, all of that time compared to if you missed the, the 10 best days your annualized return would be something like nine percent if you were fully invested in four and a half percent if you'd missed the 10 best days yeah. so it's a huge you know yeah. the, the time in the market's a real challenge as well and you hear that a lot yeah. I'll go into cash and then I'll go back yeah. in well how are you going to time that? It's it's, it's, yeah. it's a real real challenge. It's Steve Hutton says to us, it's it's time in the market, yeah. not timing the market. Yeah. Um, yeah. That uses quite a lot. Um, right, gents, I think we'll we'll wrap up on that. I think some some really valid points and hopefully some some useful um, some answers for the for the audience there. Um, I kind of want to should I ask you what we're doing at the weekend, but I guess <laughs> it's pretty pointless. Um, I'm sure I already know. Um, I think there's going to be a buzz from everybody going out well, the building tonight and. I think I think we'll all be you know we'll all be a bit nervous. I think George, it's interesting when we talk about taking risks. Mm -hmm. Like you look at Gareth Southgate during this this tournament, and you kind of go, he played um, I can't remember his name now. The the right back, left back in the first game, and everyone, Trippier. yeah, Trippier. Yeah. Why are you playing him left back? He's a, he's a right back, and you look at the different you know the different risks versus reward. We're kind of like analogy between it, but you you know in the final by some of the risks he took, he took Grealish off with you know a sub as thirty minutes. It just shows you that. It's interesting. Some people can make a, a decision in the emotion, which is mm -hmm. what he's he's done really well. But I don't know, Greg. You're you're the bigger fan here. What do you uh, that, What do you that, think? That, is it coming home? I think so, Jamie. Pre-tournament, I said Italy were going to win it, so I'm worried. Oh. Um, I, I called Italy. They Italy went on a 25 game unbeaten run up to the tournament, and they they didn't qualify for the the World Cup a couple of years earlier. So they're they're obviously a proud nation, aren't they, Italy? And they, they, even just watching them sing the anthem gives me, as an Englishman, goosebumps. Mm. So I, I think I, there's... Pretty penalty show was my favourite. Uh, yeah. I, 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 just, I just fancied Italy at the start of the tournament. England have surprised everybody. Mm. I think uh, a quarter of a semi-final would have been mm. the expectation. And I know once they got to the semi-finals, they've pretty much gave them a, a job for life, Southgate, by the looks of the contract mm. he's signed. And, so, and fair play, you're right, he's... He's done it against the grain. Yeah. I think you, you go on social media and you you read some of the morning mm. press. He, he gets it. He, he got it tough early doors, and he's he's made some controversial decisions. He's played inexperienced mm. players. He's played experienced players. He's played people out of position. He's changed his formation in between mm. games, which is rarely seen at a a major tournament. So I hope I'm wrong, and I hope England win mm. it. I've got me red tie and white yeah. shirt. I've got my red socks on for England. Oh, I've got a so blue one. I didn't realise I did that the day. You, you guys have yeah. gone for the Italian the blue. Um, but I, I, I think England will nick it. Um, uh -huh. One goal in it or maybe penalties, but that's my... What are you thinking, prediction. Craig? Are you... You've got you've got a back England, haven't you? I think there'll be a few rough heads around the country on Monday morning, <laughs> regardless of the result, but I think you've got to back yourself, haven't you? Uh, I don't know. I, what I was thinking is we could call out our audience here to put some comments online to say whether Daniel Harrison should give us all the day off if we win. <laughs> I think uh, Boris Johnson's given us yeah, the day off. Yeah, sounds uh, too. One of them needs to. Yeah, I think he put his foot in his mouth again and said. He's not going to rule it out. He didn't. I, he didn't quite answer it, but he didn't rule no, it out. You're right, Craig. It's just mm, pretty much what he's done. You know, we'll, we'll see. He was done to be fair. So. I know. What are you thinking, George? I, I I think there's such a such a buzz and so much momentum behind it now that you know they've they've got to bring it home. But it'll be it'll be so good if they do. It'll yeah. be such you know such a great atmosphere on Sunday. I mean Thursday was was wild enough, but uh, sorry Wednesday was yeah. wild enough. But uh, I think yeah. it carried on into Thursday, yeah. George. Yeah. So you're right, felt, <laughs> felt that way, didn't it? I suppose you you pass as being Italian out of us four as well, so <laughs> so, <laughs> just turn yeah. you do, so you'd be fine either way, I think. Yeah. And I've got top on underneath, yeah. Yeah. just yeah. depending on the off 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 off, yeah. just in case. And Jamie, what's your thoughts? I think that we'll win two one. Um, Bold. Yeah, um, um, I even predict a score. I, I think I think they've got a good defence, which everyone says, but I think if you've got two fast players like so Sterling or, or Saka or Ford and whoever he plays decides to play up there I think it'll be really difficult for them their type of defenders I think we'll, Agent, we'll, we'll, yeah. yeah I think we'll match I think they're good they're good players but I think I think we might just have a little bit too much for them yep. um, the way we play 
Uh, but I, I need to commit to a score because I'm the only one that's committed to a score here. So, Greg, I need one from you and then we can replay this on, on Monday on our day off. 1-0 England. 1-0. I'm going to go 2-1 as well. 2-1? I said 2-1 for the, for the last game. So there you two go, 2-1. One. One. Brilliant. OK, well, gents, thank you very much for, for joining us today. I thought that was a, a really good session. And uh, come on, England. Eh? That's a win. And thank you, everyone. Um, please like and subscribe. Uh, if you've got if you've got to add any comments, please put them in the comment box. We'll be happy to answer any any questions. But thank you very much. Thanks, gents. Thank you. Thanks. Subscribing to the True Potential YouTube channel is quick and easy. Simply go to your YouTube app on your phone, type in True Potential, and press the red subscribe option. You'll then be notified as and when new videos are released.